It's Monday, the 17th of October. This is Politics Live, as the new Chancellor makes an emergency statement and chucks out nearly all of Liz Truss's tax-cutting plans. With me today, Conservative MP Andrew Bowie, Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds, The Guardian's political editor Pippa Creera, and the deputy editor of the Conservative Home website, Henry Hill. Today, tax cuts are out as the new Chancellor performs perhaps the biggest U-turn in British economic history. We will reverse almost all the tax measures announced in the Growth Plan three weeks ago. Jeremy Hunt also says the government's massive energy support package will be scaled back. There will be more difficult decisions, I'm afraid, on both tax and spending. We will speak to money-saving expert Martin Lewis about what this might mean for our bills. The Prime Minister's tax-cutting agenda lies in tatters. Some Tory MPs are calling for her to go. If your confidence levels as a Prime Minister are in single figures, uh, the position is frankly irretrievable. Welcome to this Politics Live programme and also to viewers on the BBC News Channel. Well, in the last hour, the new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, as you heard there in the headlines, has reversed pretty well all of the tax-cutting measures announced by Kwasi Kwarteng, his predecessor, in the mini-budget about three weeks ago. He's going to be addressing MPs in the Commons at around 3.30 this afternoon. Let's listen to what he said. Firstly, we will reverse almost all the tax measures announced in the Growth Plan three weeks ago that have not started parliamentary legislation. So whilst we will continue with the abolition of the health and social care levy and stamp duty changes, we will no longer be proceeding with the cuts to dividend tax rates, the reversal of off-payroll working reforms introduced in 2017 and 2021, the new VAT-free shopping scheme for non-UK visitors, or the freeze on alcohol duty rates. Secondly, the government's current plan is to cut the basic rate of income tax to 19% from April 2023. It is a deeply held conservative value, a value that I share, that people should keep more of the money they earn. But at a time when markets are rightly demanding commitment to sustainable public finances, it is not right to borrow to fund this tax cut. So I've decided that the basic rate of income tax will remain at 20%, and it will do so indefinitely until economic circumstances allow for it to be cut. Taken together with the decision not to cut corporation tax, and restoring the top rate of income tax, the measures I've announced today will raise every year around £32 billion. Finally, the biggest single expense in the growth plan was the energy price guarantee. This is a landmark policy supporting millions of people through a difficult winter. And today I want to confirm that the support we are providing between now and April next year will not change. But beyond that, the Prime Minister and I have agreed it would not be responsible to continue exposing public finances to unlimited volatility in international gas prices. So I'm announcing today a Treasury-led review into how we support energy bills beyond April next year. The objective is to design a new approach that will cost the taxpayer significantly less than planned, whilst ensuring enough support for those in need. Any support for businesses will be targeted to those most affected, and the new approach will better incentivise energy efficiency. The most important objective for our country right now is stability. Governments cannot eliminate volatility in markets, but they can play their part, and we will do so, because instability affects the prices of things in shops, the cost of mortgages, and the values of pensions. 
There will be more difficult decisions, I'm afraid, on both tax and spending as we deliver our commitment to get debt falling as a share of the economy over the medium term. All departments will need to redouble their efforts to find savings and some areas of spending will need to be cut. But as I promised at the weekend, our priority in making the difficult decisions that lie ahead will always be the most vulnerable. And I remain extremely confident about the UK's long-term economic prospects as we deliver our mission to go for growth. But growth requires confidence and stability, and the United Kingdom will always pay its way. This government will therefore take whatever tough decisions are necessary to do so. Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, with that pretty dramatic statement. Uh, let's get reaction, first of all, from the BBC's economics editor, Faisal Islam. Faisal, just wind back three weeks ago, you were sat here in the studio with me as Kwasi Kwarteng unveiled that mini-budget. Pretty well, all of the tax-cutting measures have gone. It's extraordinary what Jeremy Hunt has just done. Both brutal and staggering to hear that statement. I mean, we use the terminology you turn all the time, don't we, in economics and politics. I think we're going to have to come up with a new taxonomy. I, I kind of came up with a, you know, a jet plane trying to do a handbrake turn, which is probably not very good. But, you know, this is so extraordinary and so quick. Mm. Um, and when you combine the 32 billion of the 45, actually, those two numbers don't tie up for an important reason, which I'll get on to. But 32 of the 45 in rough terms in three weeks and three days, no precedent for that that I can see, which is why I'm saying that it's the biggest U-turn in British economic history. And, you know, I had my iPad uh, when I was in your studio three weeks and three days ago, and we were watching the markets going down with a raised eyebrow, and I was trying to, I was trying to flash the iPad uh, on screen. I'm going to do that now because this is called the balanced scorecard. This is from the mini-budget, right? This is from that document, and it lists all the... Um, all the, th all, all, the all, all the measures and their costings. And it's basically, that's kept, gone, 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 that's kept, gone, 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 gone. Right? Extraordinary mm. stuff. We've never seen anything like that. But the reason why we've had to do this, we had a dramatic announcement in the morning that they were going to do something like this, I didn't expect it to be quite so exten uh, uh, extensive, mm. is because of the need to regain that market credibility. And I think probably Jeremy Hunt does manage to regain market credibility. That's what we've seen I I in the markets, in both for government borrowing and for currency. Yes. But the political credibility here, whether we can push this through this sort of vault fast, is another thing. And the detail I just wanted to point you towards, which I think is really important, mm. is it isn't just the re uh, reversal of mini-budget uh, policies. There's also the 19 pence cut yeah. to income tax, which was legislated for... for in it over a year's time, already factored in, that has not just been reversed for the mini-budget, which is bringing it forward one year, it's been reversed into the future. So the end result of all of this for Liz Trust, the tax cutter, is that the basic rate of tax will be higher than the plans that she inherited by one pence into the future. That's the cost of the chaos we've seen over the past three weeks and three days. Let's go back to the market response because that was the key driving force um, in terms of Jeremy Hunt wanting to, as he said himself in that statement, uh, restore some sort of stability. Has it had the desired effect? You said it has a bit. Just, just flesh that out for us in terms of the cost of government uh, borrowing, uh, the pound versus the dollar. What, what has been the instant reaction? So I think it, it's pretty stable and it's come down over the course of the day, the borrowing rates, for example, that were going up when I was in your studio uh, three weeks ago. But I think the counterfactual here is really important. What they were worried about was that it would spiral up today. Why? Because the Bank of England was withdrawing its parachute uh, of support, which has been in place for about two weeks. It was taking that away. So it really was down to the, how convinced the markets were in the policy of the government. Uh, where these numbers went today. And they've come down, they, you know, they're still higher than they were. There was still a premium, there was still a sort of chaos factor uh, in our mm. borrowing numbers, and that doesn't just affect the borrowing numbers for uh, government. That then filters through, if it's two-year borrowing or five-year borrowing, it eventually filters through into those mortgage rates, into business lending. 
but it's going in the right direction and I think that they'll take that yeah. um, if you like I know it's a, I'm, not, I'm not really into pets, but in terms of like the control of the of the chancellor of the markets, he's got their attention, right? He's got their attention. They're listening to him. Yes. They want to hear that he can get this through uh, both the Conservative Party, the cabinet, and ultimately Parliament. Uh, and that's really over to to you guys to assess the the mood over there. Mm. Uh, but I think he's got the economic credibility message through to the markets. It doesn't mean the damage done over the past. Uh, a few weeks has been solved, mm. hasn't at all, uh, but now he needs to show that he can get it through. Let, let, I yes, I was just going to say, Fazal, let's get, um, let's talk about the energy price guarantee because yeah. the government made an awful lot of the fact uh, that that was the biggest part of the mini budget. Now, as it so happens, we pretty well knew about that in the days before uh, the mini budget. So, to some extent, it was it was priced in. It looks as if there are going to be changes in terms of the scale and the length of time of that energy price. Uh, uh, guarantee. Now, that, that is going to be extremely important to households. Let's concentrate on households for the moment because for businesses it was only going to go up to April anyway and then a review. Um, what, what do you make of that from Jeremy Hunt? What was happening in markets was that they said that our borrowing, the UK's entire borrowing numbers, were now inextricably connected to the wholesale price of gas because it was an open-ended commitment that was made over a couple of years. So what he's done strategically is break that link by saying it only lasts now till April. So it's important that, that viewers know at home that the policy that was announced stays over winter. But it will be reviewed and come April, without any support, that typical famous £2,500 bill mm. uh, would be £4,000. Now, we're not saying that people will face all of that. We don't know. There was another interesting line from Jeremy Hunt saying that he wanted to incentivise energy efficiency. Mm. We've seen in these schemes in Germany that they provide subsidised energy for, I forget the precise numbers, say 80 or 90 per cent of your bill, and then the rest is the full price. It provides a massive incentive for energy efficiency. So right. it might be that they're looking at that. Um, we don't know how targeted it will be. We don't know how much money they're going to be. But it, it, it cuts the market perception link between the price of UK government borrowing and the wholesale gas yes. price over which we have no control and it's determined by, you know, Vladimir Putin's latest um, geopolitical fantasies. Uh, Faisal Islam, the BBC's economics editor, uh, thank you very much with that first reaction. Andrew Bowie, Trossonomics is dead, it seems. Uh, the growth plan, therefore, is dead. She's not being able to push through the tax-cutting measures that she wanted. In fact, the only tax-cutting measure it sounded uh, from Jeremy Hunt that's going through is because it's already gone through Parliament. Otherwise, he may have reversed that. Do you support everything Jeremy Hunt's doing? Absolutely. I think that what Jeremy announced this morning was absolutely the right thing to do. He's absolutely clear and correct that what the country, what the economy needs more than anything now is a period of stability. I think we need now, now need to give Jeremy and the Treasury the space to develop their plans more fully and to wait for the statement on the 31st of the budget, sorry, on the 31st of October uh, and then take a decision on where we go from then. It looks like uh, from initial reports from the city that this has done the job uh, at the minute. I think we should now then well, call not, for a not, period Well, not done the job. If you listen to Faisal Islam, it, they're getting a hearing. Uh, the government's getting a hearing. It hasn't reversed or in any way solved the problem. I said thus far. That's why we need a period of calm, a period of stability. We need to wait now until the 31st of October to see the budget and then take that on its merits and judge it from there. But what Jeremy announced this morning was absolutely the right thing to do and I welcome it wholeheartedly. Jonathan, your response? I mean, I have just never seen a government so out of control, so incompetent, so willfully causing damage to, to the national finances and to household finances. And it's important that people, I think they do understand this, unfortunately. Jeremy Hunt has tried to stop the bleeding, but the damage has been done. You know, mortgages will be higher than they otherwise would have been. Business investment will be lower than it otherwise would have been. There will be choices for public spending and taxation, which are now different because of the damage that has been done. And I, honestly, I would say to anyone, no matter what their politics are, what are the arguments for Liz Truss remaining as Prime Minister? And what are the arguments against a general election so the public can have a say on these things? Pippa? Well, it's very striking to me that Jeremy Hunt talked about stability. The whole point of his statement was to try and reassure and to persuade people that this government could once again get the public finances onto a stable footing. Yet, that happens against the backdrop of a government, frankly, which is lurching hour by hour through a crisis. We're going from one crisis to the next. 
so the two things are very difficult to lie, the economic, att the economic attempts with the political reality. Liz Truss's spokesman has just told reporters that she's not going anywhere, she will stay on at number 10, that she is in charge. She's meeting various groups of Conservative MPs later today before gathering her cabinet tonight in Downing Street for an informal get-together. Mm. She's trying to shore up her position. But look, let's be honest here. She's completely lost control. Jeremy Hunt well, is running the government. And that, to me, looks unsustainable. And is that how it looked to you, Henry? I mean, do you think what Jeremy Hunt said today as the Chancellor, he spent three hours, apparently, at Chequers with Liz Truss going through what he announced just an hour ago. Is it he who is running the government, not Liz Truss? It's certainly he who's running the economic policy. Uh, he's, he's, he's an incredibly powerful chancellor at this point, given the circumstances in which he's come in. And that's testified to by the fact that he's gutted the growth plan. You know, I think most observers weren't expecting nearly everything to go. Liz Truss is, is a prisoner in her own government at the moment. Economic policy is what she came in to do. Kwasi Kwarteng was a very close ally of hers. They worked on the growth plan together. And now it's gone. There's nothing left. And so the, the question is, what's she going to achieve in office? It's not as if she's a great frontline communicator. Conservative MPs aren't going to be thinking, thank goodness we have grade A campaigner Liz Truss at the helm. So without the economic policy, and it, it's difficult to see what she's going to achieve. And so I think it is a question of when, not if, she leaves office before the next election. What is the point of Liz Truss? I think this is quite self-indulgent, this discussion. What the country needs right now is a period of stability. It needs people with calm heads. It needs to be very cool and collect about where we go next. For us to change Prime Minister, as well as last week changing Chancellor, I think would uh, signal uh, even more chaos within government. So what we need is a period where we reflect on what's happened. We give the space to Jeremy Hunt to develop the economic plan that he set out. We allow him to deliver the budget and then we move on. And I think that's what the country needs more than more than anything else. And the, uh, an argument to Jonathan's and, you know, uh, question earlier on about what is preventing us going for a general election, a general election would cause even more instability. It would be six weeks, uh, even in a snap general election scenario, before we were able to form a government of any kind. So what we need now is just to get on with the job in hand. Yes, mistakes have been made. Yes, the government has acknowledged that. Jeremy Hunt is taking action to rectify those mistakes. And I think it's up to all of us to calm down, look at where we are, and in the national interest, move this country forward reflecting on what's happened. We'll come back to the politics in just a moment. Uh, let's talk to Paul Johnson from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Uh, welcome to you, Paul. You were also here in the studio on the day of the mini-budget just over three weeks ago. What did you make of Jeremy Hunt's statement today? Well, as we've heard, he's reversed nearly everything that hasn't already been or is on the way through legislation. I don't think that's actually... I'm sort of less surprised, I think, than others that he's done that as a down payment on what is clearly a really difficult fiscal situation it was almost certainly necessary and I think it would only be that kind of scale of change which is likely to really reassure the markets that it's being taken seriously I simply abandoning the corporation tax uh, cut for example which we saw last week mm. was never going to be enough so this is a really big change a complete about turn but I think one that was broadly speaking, inevitable. Right. In terms, though, on spending, you also, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, sort of estimated, because we didn't have independent figures from the Office for Budget Responsibility, a £60 billion black hole that would have to be filled, uh, probably through spending cuts. Um, the measures, Jeremy Hunt says, will raise £32 billion. Do you see the rest, then, coming from spending cuts? Well, look, there's quite a lot of things in that. I mean, it sounds from the um, uh, leaks, it seems, from the OBR over the weekend that they've come up with very similar numbers. But these are numbers several years out. And given that we're no longer having really big tax cuts, I think that give, buys the Chancellor a bit of time. Oh. But at least say, let's wait and see, um, rather than penciling in cuts for four or five years down the road. But he did say quite clearly in today's statement that he's going to be looking at efficiencies or cuts over the next couple of years. Now, that is going to be really quite painful if he does anything at all significant because spending over the next couple of years looks very tight in any case, but in particular because of the very high levels of inflation that we're facing. I think there's a, there's a really fine judgment here for the chance. I think in a way it was quite straightforward. Let's bin most of these tax cuts. Mm. What he says on spending is a much harder judgment. Uh, well, can we just re remind uh, viewers, it was only last Wednesday, incredibly, uh, days ago, at Prime Minister's questions, um, that the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, asked Liz Truss on precisely this issue. Uh, let's have a listen.
maybe we can't play that just at the During her leadership contest, the Prime Minister said, and I quote her exactly, I'm very clear, I'm not planning public spending reductions. Is she going to stick to that? Prime Minister! Absolutely. Absolutely. What we are... Look, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, we are spending... We are spending almost a trillion pounds of public spending. We were spending 700 billion back in 2010. What we will make sure is that over the medium term, the debt is falling. But we will do that not by cutting public spending, but by making sure we spend public money well. So, more efficiencies. Paul, is that credible? Well, I mean, government, the Treasury can always um, say that it's going to make less money available to departments as it's done over the last many years. It's difficult to do, though. I mean, there are some tough decisions, really hard ones, that have been mooted, like not increasing welfare benefits even in line with inflation. But if you look at the big public service areas, what are the big, what are the big spending areas? So the biggest one is the NHS. Are we really going to cut the NHS? I don't think so. Um, the next one is pensions. Well, are they, Prime Minister has already said that she's going to at least raise those in line with prices. Then you've got the working age welfare that I mentioned. What's the next biggest after that? Education. Well, you're going to cut education if you're really focused on growth. Next biggest after that is defence. Well, Prime Minister wants to increase defence spending by 50%. So these are really hard areas to cut. And um, we've already had a year in which public sector pay is rising by about 5% on average in the face of 10% inflation. So public sector workers already had big pay cuts over the last decade are going to get some more. So you can always find something to do, but none of it's going to be in the least bit easy. And relative to current plans, I think you know if the Chancellor really takes much out of it, it really will be a return to austerity. In other words, actually cutting the amount of money that goes to public services. Uh, Paul Johnson at the IFS, thank you very much. Your response to that, those difficult decisions, where are you going to have to make those savings and cuts? Well, this is precisely why we need to give Jeremy Hunt the space to develop his economic plan moving forward, because, as he said, there are going to be difficult decisions that have to be made. Um, I personally would be very against uh, not... Uh, raising benefits in line with inflation. I'd be personally very against uh, going against the plans to increase the defence budget, especially at a time of such turmoil on the European continent. But there are going to be areas, quite clearly, uh, where, the government's going to have to, where the government's going to have to take some tough decisions. Uh, we've been in this uh, place before, and it's right that Jeremy is given the time and the space uh, to do that right now. It's the fiscally conservative, sensible thing to do, and he has my full support in doing that. I mean, I would just say, fair play to you for coming on, Andrew, but the idea that any Conservative could, could pitch themselves as the party of stability and fiscal responsibility after the last three weeks. We weren't talking about spending cuts three weeks ago. That's the scale of the damage that has been done. And I'll say something else. Look, there are many Conservative colleagues who've been elected for the first time in constituencies mm. that were promised higher public spending, uh, levelling up, a bit vague, but you know the intention, I think, that it'd be something for them was there. There aren't the votes in Parliament for a return to austerity. If that's what the Conservative Party wants to do, it's going to have to fight an election to get a mandate for that, because otherwise, frankly, there'll be no basis for that. And also, look, where we're left with, with Jeremy Hunt is, I, I don't know what the Conservative economic policy is right now. I, I've genuinely got no idea. I know bits have been kept of the budget, the bankers bonus stuff, so maybe it's still this kind of trickle-down uh, approach. But look, you need fresh ideas to improve economic growth. That's the bit Liz Truss was right on. You know, the last 12 years have been very poor for the British economy. But the, the fresh ideas aren't going to come from this, this crisis hour-to-hour -hour management. And we all know right now, as soon as, you, as soon as you come off air, you'll have missed calls from Cabinet Ministers who are ringing around because they've got their own leadership bids already underway. Everybody knows this. There's no point denying it. Mm. The stability is not there. It's not going to come. It will only come from a change of government with new ideas and a fresh mandate to tackle the horrendous problems the Conservative Party. That, that's why it's up to us to be responsible and, and to not engage in the self-indulgent politics that, that this place, SW1, obsesses over as to who's in what job and when. It's up to us as uh, members of Parliament, as members of the government, to uh, take decisions in the national interest. Uh, put aside party politics, put aside our own electoral uh, fortunes, put aside whether or not individual MPs hold their seats come the next election. What we need to do right now is to reassure the markets, get the economy on a steady footing, and Can't that's what that. Jeremy Hunt did you, right now. Truss cannot reassure the markets because she is the cause of the problem. She's trying to reassure them 
against, and I agree it's not about who would just what job in, in this government, it's about the fact that everyone who has a mortgage in this country is now paying considerably more because of what happened three weeks ago. Business investment, which was already the lowest in the G7, I would say the cause of a lot of our economic problems, is about to fall. We're going to be second bottom of the G20. You know, financial stability, this country ranks behind Italy in financial stability right now. You cannot be the answers with respect to the problems and, that you are responsible for. And that's why we've got to take some tough decisions, and that's why Jeremy Hunt's got to be given the space over the next few weeks to put some flesh on the bones of what he announced this morning. Are you happy? Are you still happy to have Liz Truss as your Prime Minister? Well, Liz Truss is the Prime Minister. She has the confidence yeah, but of are the you happy? Are you happy with that? Uh, yes, I am, because at the end of the day, getting rid of a Prime Minister right now would cause even more instability, and that's the thing we, uh, we need less of. We need more stability, we need calm heads, we need a coolness in the centre of government, and I think that we need to give Jeremy Hunt the space and the time oh. to develop that plan and move forward. And getting rid of a Prime Minister today would cause even more instability. But maybe by Christmas. Look, look I mean, I'm not going to get uh, drawn into a rabbit hole or any hypothetical situations of what, when and, and who might do which job and where. Uh, but what we need right now is to rally behind the Chancellor and the Prime Minister and to deliver this economic plan that's being developed right now. All right. Uh, we're going to talk to the BBC's political editor uh, shortly, Chris Mason. Just before I will uh, show everybody this tweet from Liz Truss, the Prime Minister. The British people rightly want stability, which is why we are addressing the serious challenges we face in worsening economic conditions. We've taken action to chart a new course for growth that supports and delivers for people across the United Kingdom. Um, Chris Mason, um, we've just heard Andrew Bowie say a couple of times we need to give Jeremy Hunt time and space. Is Liz Truss going to have much more time and space to remain as Prime Minister if some of her Tory MPs have their way? They want to see her gone within weeks. Time and space uh, looks at a premium in Downing Street at the moment. The hope uh, in Downing Street is that what we're seeing from Jeremy Hunt today might buy them a little of both. Because, frankly, if we look at the U-turns, every single one has been done short of Liz Truss herself U-turning, walking out the front door of Downing Street and not coming back. That's the only thing that hasn't happened here. The entire Liz Trust programme for government, save for one or two things, is dead, completely and utterly gone. And so critics will say within the party, and by the way, they are saying that, texting me this lunchtime, that what is the point of a Liz Truss administration when the very programme for government that she won office on mm. has gone into the Thames, the Skip, the Shredder, the Pyre, call it what you want. Now, she will hope that by doing all of this, she can make an argument. We haven't heard her make this argument directly in these terms yet, but that perhaps she could say, you know, she's being pragmatic. She recognises her original vision for a Conservative government has not survived contact with reality. So here is an alternative one and that she won a leadership race and she, uh, you know, accepted forming a government from the king and she's changed course and she's going to make try and make the best of it. But when you speak to Conservative MPs in private, yes, there are a range of views. Yes, there are some who say Liz Truss should be given some time. But you don't find many, or indeed any, enthusiastically endorsing the idea of Liz Truss leading them into the next general election. So it does seem to be a case of when rather than if there might be some sort of change. Joe, the thing I'm struck by is just not very long ago at the mm. Conservative conference, which was a nightmare uh, for the party, mm. plenty of people were deeply, deeply uncomfortable with Liz Truss and how things were going, but even more so about what they saw as the kind of ridiculousness of changing leaders so soon. They're now so uncomfortable that that ridiculousness, mm. as so many of them see it, is perhaps a better option uh, than not doing anything. That's where I think we are this lunchtime. We're going to go on and talk about the potential impact on households, on families of the current financial and economic situation. But politically, um, Chris, when you sit there today in the studio um, and you think about Liz Truss and her so-called survival plan, um, just take us through the stages that she is going to try and win back some support from both her MPs and Cabinet Ministers. So two things to mention here. One is what we're hearing from her today and from the Chancellor, more to the point, is an attempt to reassure the markets. But at the same time as reassuring those markets, he is also talking, as we know, in very stark terms about getting rid of tax cuts and spending cuts coming. So what might be reassuring to the markets might be deeply uncomfortable for many people at home watching our conversation now. As far as the Prime Minister is concerned and the hopes for choreography of the rest of the day, so we have uh, the Chancellor on his feet at about half past three this afternoon. 
There is then what's being described as a reception for the cabinet taking place uh, this evening. Clearly, outwardly, Downing Street trying to lay it on thick that they are consulting the cabinet about what they are doing, particularly the measures still to come uh, in a fortnight's time in that economic statement to coincide with the publication of the numbers by the uh, Office for Budget Responsibility. That's when we can expect to hear, I suspect, a lot about spending cuts. Uh, lots of the cabinet kind of frozen out of those decisions that came before the mini-budget. Mm. This time they're going out of the way to try and emphasise that they are hearing from the cabinet. She'll also talk to the One Nation group of uh, Conservative MPs and then starting today and running all week is basically giving, giving every single Conservative MP in kind of regional groupings a chance to speak to the Prime Minister and tell her what they think. So kind of listening mode, consultation mode, clinging on mode, all being uh, sort of the buttons being pressed go on by mm. the Prime Minister as she tries to reassure her party that it's worthwhile them clinging to her, sticking with her for the time being. But things look for her really, really bleak. Chris Mason, uh, the BBC's political editor, thank you very much. Uh, just responding um, to that, Pippa, we understand also that the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, is now briefing um, MPs uh, in one of the committee rooms over in Parliament ahead of his statement uh, this afternoon. Um, how do you view attempts and moves by Liz Truss to shore up any support? I don't think they're going to be successful, ultimately. I mean, I suspect that MPs have come to the conclusion that they need to give Jeremy Hunt the time and the space, as Andrew says, to deliver his, his, the rest of his budget on Halloween, to see the OBR forecasts themselves, and to see what potentially the government could do going forward. But everything that we're hearing from Liz Truss at the moment, with language in her political cabinet this morning about, again, blaming global factors, um, these meetings with MPs, the tweets here, none of it is actually owning the problem. I mean, she was a key part of it. She was the one that went on stage at Tory party conference and promised disruption, her word, and yet is now saying, recognising belatedly, that people want stability. She should, you know, she, she's not known as being a particularly effective communicator, but surely the one thing that people need to hear, and the, the public, forget her own MP, MPs for a minute, the public need to hear from her, her, is an apology, a recognition that she got things wrong and that she has realised and learnt from her mistakes going forward and that she would do things differently. I think the one thing saving her at the moment is precisely the point that Andrew makes, that MPs are concerned, Tory MPs are concerned, that by binning her now, they end up in a more difficult predicament afterwards, not least because they don't know who would replace her. I think Liz Truss's ultimate problem is that she is a hostage of two different groups that want different things, and that's the market and her MPs. Now, the markets, they are listening to what Jeremy Hunt is saying. Jeremy Hunt is offering, he's talking like a 2009 Conservative, you know, fiscal responsibility, making tough decisions. That's good for the markets. A lot of Tory MPs, especially the ones in the red wall, those millions of voters who backed the Tories for the first time in 2019, they were elected on a high spending programme, or at least a higher spending programme. So they're actually not going to be, you know, they're, they're probably pleased that the polls or the markets will stabilise, but they're not going to be satisfied with the Chancellor coming and saying, well, actually, I'm going to be making efficiencies and spending cuts and there's not going to be any money for levelling up. They're already worried. This was their big worry under Boris Johnson, that we're more than halfway through this parliament and they just don't have enough to put on their leaflets to justify voters backing them a second time. What they want from the Prime Minister is a commitment to Northern Powerhouse Rail, to levelling up and to spending. And there's no money for it. I mean, is it that the party is now ungovernable? And there are too many different factions wanting too many different things, that it's impossible because of what Henry has just set out. Uh, they're diametrically opposed in, in terms of what they want uh, a government to do. Well, look, the Tory party has always been a very broad church. Yeah. <coughs> different opinions uh, drawn from across a range of uh, different political backgrounds. Look, I backed the other guy over the summer. It would be the easiest thing in the world for Rishi me to Suna. sit. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be the easiest thing in the world for me to sit here and and say, well, we warned of this and all mm. the rest of it. That would be well, contrary. It's true, isn't it? That would be contrary to the national interest. That's not where we are right now. And I'm very uh, willing to uh, give the prime minister a hearing to try and work with her and with other colleagues to try and make this work. Yes, give Jeremy Hunt the space, but then to move this country forward. That's what's in the national interest. And really, again, the self-indulgent and rather you oh. know self-obsessed nature of politics and ourselves, uh, even. So sitting around this table talking about who's in what job. I just don't think that helps. This morning we saw a very grown-up, fiscally conservative, responsible statement by the Chancellor. Absolutely the right thing to do. Well, that sort of thing we need to see more of in the next few weeks, and that sort of thing I'll be supporting. Well, we'll see whether you're a lone voice or not. Uh, you talk about self-indulgence. Let's listen to the Conservative MP, Crispin Blunt. If your confidence levels as a Prime Minister are in single figures, uh, the position is frankly irretrievable, and we don't have time uh, now, between now and over the next two years, to waste 
in seeing if we can uh, repair Liz as our Prime Minister and as our party leader so that she could command the confidence of the public. Uh, we need to make a change. Uh, we need to deliver uh, sound money and sound administration uh, and get on with the growth agenda about the difficult and complicated changes in regulations to advance the supply side measures to try and address the growth paradox we've got. All of that is difficult and complicated and is going to need uh, to carry confidence. And we need a chief minister and a spokesman uh, who can uh, uh, address the public in a way that is credible. Andrew? Yeah, I, fun, uh, I, I take all that from Crispin. He's a very experienced, right. long-serving member of parliament and, you know, his, his, his use is right to hear them. But I don't understand how on earth we get to that stage ah. if we engage in, you know, uh, fratricide and, and, and infighting that we've seen too much of, frankly, in the Conservative Party over the last uh, few years. It's, it's not comfortable for, for many of us, but we are where we are. We need to support the Chancellor and what he's trying to do. We need to give the Prime Minister a hearing. We need to try and make this work in the national interest. And that's what I and I hope a majority of my colleagues are going to do over the next few weeks. All right, well, we'll see, of course, if that actually uh, pans out. I mean, Jonathan, when it comes to the national interest, if we look now at what is left of the measures that were unveiled by Kwasi Kwarteng, they're measures that the Labour Party has and can sign up to. Um, you agreed uh, to the reversal in the national insurance contributions. That has now gone through Parliament. You agree with the energy intervention, even if it's going to be scaled back. In fact, it was Labour, uh, Labour's plan that only went up to April next year in the first instance. So actually, there is nothing for you to be upset about now in terms of the measures and the content that we're left with from that budget. Well, I think there's plenty for everyone to be upset with across the country because of the impact on people's budgets and the national finances too. But look, we never supported the rise in national insurance and we've just been entirely consistent by maintaining that position. I mean, the big question is really what what is this government now trying to uh, achieve? Or, I mean, the, or is it what the alternative would be? Well, because I, if, I, I, if, if you've had briefings that you're on an election footing, um, apparently uh, Labour frontbenchers like yourself are getting lessons from the Institute for Government in terms of how to run a government, it looks as if you feel you're on the precipice of perhaps taking over uh, if a mechanism was found. Um, what is it that you are going to outline to the country? I mean, it's day one of a Labour government. What would those difficult decisions look like under Labour? Well, I think they're not difficult. They're the obvious things we need to do. So the first priorities we have, we'll bring back a long-term industrial strategy. We'll put long-term business investment at the heart of what we believe the eco economic problems of the UK have been in the last few years. We will reform business rates, which I think are a serious barrier to business investment. We'll improve our trading position with the single market because there are things that other countries have in terms of the relationship. A closer with the, relationship with the well, EU. Well, there are things like a veterinary agreement or a mutual recognition of professional qualifications for a service-based economy would make a difference. These are things the Labour movement is entirely united around stronger uh, employment rights so you don't get the p and ferry scandal. These are things that are, that are actually tangible things that would improve growth. I mean, I've always said, I, obviously I oppose the, the top-down, trickle-down approach that we saw in the mini-budget, but I also don't think it works. You know, and you've had a, an amazing coalition from the Archbishop of Canterbury to the IMF share that view as well. So Except you got... did agree with the cut in the basic rate of income tax. Are you sorry that's gone? Well, our position has been that we believe personal taxation is high mm. because growth has been so poor for the last 12 years. So right. we could consistently support that. Clearly Clearly now, look where we've got to with the impact on the national finances. We've got to see the OBR figures before we can make any serious decisions. But would you go into the next election wanting to cut it? Well, we'll have to see what the OBR figures say, but it, it's unlikely to make a spending commitment in regard to that, given the, the catastrophic impact of the mini-budget and where it has been. But our plans are about stronger growth, stronger employment rights, stronger you know, benefits for all parts yeah, of the country. But, yeah. but also, you know, quite frankly, I, I don't know where government policy is. And in terms of their overall philosophy, Joe, I, I just do not support this trickle down nonsense that somehow you know tax cuts for the better off would have would have benefited us all. Right. Well, they've gone. How, can I, can I question? How would you pay for all that? Because the, 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 we're, we're having a discussion now about uh, the issues that have arisen through planning for unfunded tax cuts. But Labour are planning to pretty much spend exactly the same, also unfunded, except no, no, it wouldn't go no, towards tax. So yes, you any, are. Any so how would you me, pay I'll for it? Any day-to-day -day increase in spending has been hypothecated to sources of revenue. So, for instance, abolishing the non-DOM rule brings in over £3 billion. That's what would pay for the expansion of the NHS workforce that was announced at conference. We would, for instance, change the taxation of private equity, which we would bring more money from. We would not treat, you know, private schools as charities, that's a revenue raiser. So we've always identified that. I accept the fact that you have, you know, destroyed this government's 
credibility in terms of its ability to borrow to invest, and we'll have to see where we are when the OBR uh, you know, forecasts come in on that. But where we wanted additional ambition on expenditure, it was about investment spending, using net zero as a hook to get good jobs in all parts of the country. We know, of course, that not uh, meeting our obligations on net zero would cost the country more in the long term, and that was the, the paradigm of that decision. But on day-to-day -day expenditure, no, we do not believe in borrowing money to pay for tax cuts or any other day-to-day -day expenditure outside of a crisis, and that's why we always identify sources of revenue, hypothecate those to the increases in public spending we put forward. But that's not what Keir Starmer has been saying. But it, it is what Keir Starmer no, has not, been saying. I, I, up until I, I, a few I, days I, ago, that's like the exact opposite. It's to not. What Keir it's not. And I understand it's hard for Conservative MPs who, let's be honest, like many of you, have seen everything, in a sense, you believe in, you know, fall apart in the last three weeks. And I understand that's hard, but don't put words in our mouth because we've always said, and Keir has been criticised in some quarters for, for for having that position, as has Rachel. But that commitment to fiscal responsibility now you see more than at any other time why that is so essential for long-term growth and prosperity in the UK. Uh, Andrew, there is one question uh, which we heard really from Faisal Islam and to some extent uh, Paul Johnson. Do you accept that any tax rises or spending cuts are going to be bigger now? whatever Jeremy Hunt does or says as a result of the damage from or the fallout from the mini-budget? Well, we're going to have to wait and see exactly what the Chancellor says uh, on the 31st of October. Let's have a look at this um, tweet from Nadine Dorries, who supported uh, Liz Truss, um, I think. There is no unity candidate. She was a former Culture Secretary under uh, Boris Johnson. No one has enough support. Only one MP has a mandate from party members and from the British public. A mandate... <laughs> Stop laughing, everybody. A mandate with an 80-seat majority. Boris Johnson. The choices are simple. Back Liz. If not, bring back Boris or face a general election within weeks. Oh. Henry. I mean, I think Nadine missed her calling as a Japanese soldier in World War II. <laughs> um, I, you know, it, is, it is admirable that Boris Johnson still has a handful of supporters. But honestly, like, I think it's important. Actually, it is an important point because there are Conservative members who think this. It's important to remember where we were when we got rid of Boris Johnson and why. No one takes away Boris's achievement in 2019. I think that the movement, he, the direction he was trying to take the Conservative Party in was the right one. But he had destroyed his credibility. And he had lost the faith of the British people over Partygate and everything else. And getting rid of him was the right decision. And the reason we're not hearing about those scandals anymore is because he's no longer prime minister. So if we did bring him back, all of that stuff, which hasn't mm. gone anywhere, would simply be back in the headlines. So, so no, whatever the decision is, we know what it isn't. And it isn't Boris Johnson. Pippa? I disagree with that, particularly if <laughs> Boris Johnson, who we're told by friends still hasn't give up on a, on, given up on his hopes of a comeback at some point, were he to make it back to the front line at some stage, then I think that all the questions about his own integrity and probity would come up again. There's a lot of unanswered questions. There's a lot of stories that journalists like, like myself mm. could resume were he in the front line. And I think the Tory party might want to think very carefully about whether it decided it wanted to, wanted to bring him back. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of the members who elected Liz Truss, what about them um, and the tax-cutting agenda that they backed? So, it is a, ultimately, constitutionally, Tory MPs are responsible for choosing the Prime Minister, and that is, that, is a, that is a heavy democratic responsibility that they have in our system. Under the Conservative Party's rules, they do delegate that to the membership, but that's not, there's no constitutional power in that. And if the Tory MPs lose confidence in the Prime Minister, that's it. The, the membership... The, the, the mandate bestowed by the party membership does not trump mm. the responsibility of MPs in the parliamentary system. It's vitally important to say that um, whenever this comes up. Well, Andrew, respond to this, your uh, Conservative colleague Ben Bradley. Well, that effectively renders all the political fallout, criticism, dive in the polls, etc., of the last few weeks entirely pointless, doesn't it? Right back where we started, just far less popular than before. Is that a good summary? <laughs> yeah, Ben's a good mate of mine, and it's, yeah, he, he, he says things, uh, he puts it bluntly. Um, look, I mean, I can only repeat what I said at the beginning. Oh, no, don't repeat it. No, well, find I something different to, no, because, find something really different to say and try and engage really with, with what I mean, your colleagues I mean, are saying. I mean, look, Ben's a good friend. Nadine's part of Boris's Praetorian Guard. Crispin Blunt's got his views. I mean, but what's important is the majority of us now look at the serious situation we're in, get behind the Chancellor, well, you know give that? the Prime Minister space to develop this economic plan alongside Jeremy, listen to what they're saying on the 31st of October, think about the national rather than the selfish or political interest and move this country forward. And I think that's where, I think that's where a majority of Conservative MPs find themselves this morning. People may be asking, what is, Le what is Keir Starmer going to do now? What is he going to do this week in terms of your party's position? 
Well, look, if the three options are uh, back Liz, bring back Boris, or a general election within weeks, as Nadine has set out, I think we'll Boris. Take general election <laughs> <laughs> within weeks is, as I think, probably. That's why all, all routes lead to a general election, surely, don't they? I mean, well, I, I don't know whether Liz Truss will be Prime Minister by Friday. I, I, I feel perhaps not at this stage from what Conservative MPs are, are saying. And clearly their, their mini-drama will, will be going on as it has been. The role for the Labour Party in this is to continue doing what Keir Starmer has done since he became leader, because it's not automatic in our system that if one party loses the trust of the British people, it just transfers to the other side. What Keir has done has put the Labour Party in a position where people can turn to us in this moment of national crisis, and I think he deserves credit for that. We'll continue to do that. But look, there is no route out of this crisis that comes with another Conservative leader or, or the fifth... It wouldn't be the fifth Chancellor this year? Fifth in five months? Well, there was one a month, wasn't Fourth there? Four Fourth, Fourth, yes. The stability, with respect, cannot come from a party that has already given us that. It requires a change, a fresh mandate and a new government. Right. I mean, we're also getting this from the Conservative MP, uh, Mark Garnier. He's told BBC Radio 5 Live that if the party installs another new leader, then he would find it perfectly acceptable that we should have a general election and actually test the validity of that leader to the wider public. Um, do you agree with him? I think Conservative MPs should uh, keep their counsel uh, and avoid uh, tweeting in a fit of pique and answering questions to journalists. I think it's, it's not helpful. It's certainly not conducive to the national interest. Yes, we do need to have uh, conversations. Yes, we absolutely need to find a way through. Yes, we have to, have, have to ask difficult questions of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and the rest of the government, as I said, in the national interest. But frankly, uh, Conservative MPs taking to the airwaves and, you know, um, criticising the government or espousing their views on where we should head next is not helpful, not conducive to the national interest. Let's take a pause because um, we can introduce the money-saving expert Martin Lewis uh, onto the programme. Hello to you, uh, Martin. First of all, your Hi. reaction to the statement from Jeremy Hunt. Well, I mean, clearly trustonomics have gone. Uh, and we are now back in the position that we were when all this started, except there's been damage to the economy in the meantime, and that is going to have had a knock-on effect to people's pockets. So it has been a, a very sorry affair. I think it, it looks like Jeremy Hunt has managed to stabilise things which are important. Uh, on the energy price guarantee, which mm. is obviously a core area, I was perhaps one of the loudest voices calling for intervention in energy because it was going to be absolutely devastating to people this winter if we didn't have that energy intervention. Um, I, I was very plain when it came out that I welcomed the intervention, but I did caveat it from, from the first moment by mm. saying it is a very expensive way to intervene and it, it is a poorly targeted way to intervene but as I had called for intervention and we needed intervention, I welcomed it. Uh, getting rid of it in April won't be a problem as long as the net for the support that remains is stretched high enough. It cannot just be support for those on benefits and pensioners and those with disabilities. It will need to stretch for more help for those who are on middle incomes too. We don't yet know what situation we will go back to in April. I presume the price cap will come back into effect. Um, I'm, you know, we're working right now and looking on what the predictions for the price cap will be from April onwards because obviously we'd stop looking at it and the analysis now needs to be done. My guess is it'll be in the, uh, for somebody on typical usage, there is no such thing, but it's mm. the way that we talk about it, it'll probably be in the three to four thousand pound level. Now, what is interesting about all this, I think, when you look at it, is it seems to me, I, I do genuinely believe, as we're on a politics show, that the, 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 the blindness to this energy problem is, is ultimately the cause uh, of the downfall of, of the government's policies. In, during the zombie government period and the leadership campaign, there was neither plan nor promise on what was going to happen with energy, even though it was blindingly obvious to everybody at the time that the price cap was going to be astronomical and there had to be intervention. So during that leadership campaign, what we got was lots of tax cut promises and an ignorance of the fact that we were going to need to intervene on energy. There was also Liz Truss saying that she didn't like handouts, and handouts was the dirty word as a way of differentiating herself, differentiating herself from Rishi Sunak. They then get into government. They suddenly see the scale of problem on energy, where well, they should have seen it before, but they hadn't planned to do both. They then come up with a scheme that because they can't do handouts, so they can't do targeted benefits, 
to get away from the handout term, they have to go for universal support, which is incredibly expensive and poorly targeted. And then they continue to do the election tax promises, which are both costing the same amount at the same time. And when you put both of those together, that is why the House of Cards tumbled. A lot of this could have been foreseen. And I think the structure of the way that we had the zombie government and the electoral campaign that allowed candidates um, to ignore the obvious coming impending doom of yes. what was going to go on in, in energy with an 80% price cap rise on top of 54% and probably a further rise in January I think is probably what's come back on all of this and we just need governments who do planning and prevention when there's something coming in forward rather than what we seem to be getting which is just reactive crisis. All right. That's not what we need from our government and it's caused a lot of problems. Well one of the things that people might be hopeful about is the cost of mortgages um, because there was very much um, a feeling that on the back of the mini budget by Kwasi Kwarteng, the former Chancellor, uh, that the Bank of England Governor, Andrew Bailey, would be in a position of raising interest rates to continue to try and rein in inflation. And that has fed through to higher mortgage rates, which is a huge worry and anxiety for homeowners, particularly those on fixed mortgages that are going to come out in the next three, six months or a year. Do you get any sense that off the back of today's statement that they may not, interest rates, have to go up as high as perhaps the Bank of England governor had indicated? Well, we hope that the impact of this is they do not have to go up as high and as quickly as they were because it is the shock of the speed of the interest rate rises that is really going to hurt people. Uh, but, you know, we're going to have to wait for the markets to react. The Chancellor hasn't even given the full statement yet, so we don't know where this is going to go. But what I would say is the fact that this may have mitigated some of those rises does not stop. It follows on from what I've said before. I have been calling now for the past couple of weeks for regulatory intervention in the mortgage market to put protective measures in if we do get these high rates. Now, I need to be very plain. That is not calling for a bailout. It is calling to look at measures, and these are, these are example suggestions. They would need proper research, such as more flex flexibility for people to be able to change their term and change it back, mortgage payment holidays, a change to affordability tests, which at the moment mean some people are applying for 5% fixes, being rejected because they fail an affordability test, and that means they have to have an even higher rate. Well, mm -hmm. if you can't afford the cheaper rate, how can you afford the higher rate? Um, and far more forbearance from the banks, whose right. margins are increasing because they're putting mortgage rates up and the savings rates aren't going up commensurately. That plan should be in place by Christmas to put us in a position in spring that we can help people if, doesn't mean it will happen, if interest rates go up. Right. Regulatory intervention shouldn't cost the state, but we need to start focusing on those things and doing it soon. All right. You said at an awards ceremony, uh, I think in the last few days, that someone has got to get a grip on the economy. Do you think that's happening? I think, I think that, you know, that the grip is being had. Yeah, this, the, the changes that are happening at the moment, I don't, you know, we don't like them. We didn't want to be in this mm. position, but I think they're necessary where we are right now. Right. And in the short term, I think this is a level of control that was needed. Um, but, but clearly, we are still... And, and, and I know this isn't a financial point, but the situation with the Prime Minister still leads to huge amounts of uncertainty and uncertainty factors into personal finances and the economy. Well, While the Chancellor seems to have got a grip, the, 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 the volatility in the political situation isn't good for anybody. Oh, well, let's put that to Andrew. Stay with us, uh, Martin, because we've only got a few minutes till the end of the programme. Anyway, with that point, that is the critical point, isn't yeah, it? it? Instability is. that Martin Lewis says stems from the Prime Minister having lost credibility and authority and that feeds into problems for people's personal finances, what happens to their mortgages and what happens to their energy bills. I don't disagree with anything that Martin just said there. I think he's absolutely right. I think a grip is being gotten. We didn't want to be in the situation we are in, but we are here. But in terms of volatility and instability, I keep saying the worst thing that we could do right now is lurch into another uh, leadership election uh, or a moratory psychodrama. We've got to uh, focus on the job in hand. We've got to get through to 31st October. We've got to give Jeremy the space to develop his budget and because anything else, anything other than that, will just frighten the markets more and will have a negative impact on people's personal finances. Uh, Martin, you agree? I, I, I'll leave the solution to other people in politics. I'm not sure... Well, I, I'm, I don't know which is better or worse, the Prime Minister staying or the Prime Minister going, to what, be honest. I what, think you have instability either way round. All right, well, on I'll that, leave that for others uh, to decide. Pippa, are we hearing that there is going to be an urgent question uh, in Parliament on the economy? So the House of Commons Speaker has granted Labour an urgent question on the economic crisis. This would take place before Jeremy Hunt's 
statement to the Commons later on the economy. Um, the reality of these things, though, while we would all hope and expect that she turns up, because where is Liz Truss at the moment, frankly? Nobody's seen her publicly for well, days. Well, surely she's going to be there Friday. next to her Chancellor. She'll be there next to her Chancellor, but whether she will answer questions herself, I think, probably is a bit of a stretch. I suspect she'll send somebody junior in her place, but I think it's a missed opportunity where she could try and reassure her MPs that she is in charge and the country that she knows what she's doing. Well, if there is an urgent question, shouldn't it be Prime Minister Liz Truss that answers those questions about the economic crisis, as Labour is putting I'm it? I'm a little surprised that the urgent question has been granted, frankly, given that the Chancellor of the Exchequer was going to be giving a statement on the economy this afternoon uh, anyway. It's up to Number 10 Downing Street to determine who actually answers urgent questions from the dispatch. Box. Wouldn't it be better just to wait and hear what the Chancellor is going to say further to what he's already said, Jonathan? I think most people think it's reasonable that we hear from the Prime Minister, given the chaos she has caused. And if she can't turn up to do an urgent question in Parliament, look, it's over. I mean, it, I mean that is the minimum mm. level of being the Prime Minister we would expect. If Jeremy Hunt is in charge, fair enough, yes. but just formalise it. That, 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 that would usually be... But not on the day when there's a statement going to be made on the economy by the guy who's in charge of the economy in the afternoon. So I'm, I'm, anything that will I'm, be said I'm, by the, in the urgent question will be, frankly, just wait for a few minutes look, until the Chancellor I mean, gets to his feet. I can, you can predict we, that we, right we now. We can talk about form and practice, but you know, it was this government who put a budget on a Friday that completely crashed both the value of sterling and government borrowing costs. It was this government that doubled down on that over the weekend. It was this government that has given us a Chancellor every month. I mean, you can't say, let's do things how they should be done when, when you're behaving this way. And that's I think been, we want to hear from the Prime Minister. And that's been recognised and hopefully being rectified and that's why we need to give them space to do it. And frankly, calling government ministers to dispatch work every five minutes actually distracts from the work of government, which is exactly resolve too much this of crisis. In the crisis. I mean, do you really think we've seen too much? I think we should wait to hear what Jeremy has to say this afternoon. Before we go to the end of the programme, Martin uh, Lewis, before we uh, let you go, if there was one thing you wanted to hear, one thing more you would like to hear in this statement this afternoon uh, from the Chancellor that might be you know, good for voters, for households, for families, what would it be? Uh, it'd be two things. It'd one be the mortgage intervention I talked about before, and two, that we're going to get the September inflation figures on Wednesday. Those are normally the figures that benefit, pensions and benefits are uprated on. I think they need to get rid of this debate and say right now that benefits will be uprated with inflation, uh, not with average earnings when we get those figures on Wednesday. I think there are a lot of very desperate people who are feeling vulnerable because of the cost of living crisis, and they need to be given some reassurance too, as well as the market. Uh, Martin Lewis, the money-saving expert. Thank you very much uh, for joining is Henry, your reaction? Um, I think a period of silence from the Prime Minister makes tactical sense because I don't think Liz Truss oh. has yet made a public intervention that's enhanced her position and she doesn't have much position left to lose. But ultimately, that's the problem. This is... This urgent question would be a good opportunity for the Prime Minister, who is the person, uh, when all this turns, to... You know, assert herself, reassure her backbenchers, maybe send a message to Labour. If she can't do it, if she can't rise to these occasions, that's only going to confirm to Conservative MPs, if you're not in this for trustonomics, what on earth is she in that very important role for? You need somebody who is able to step up to the dispatch box to take on these parliamentary moments and ideally take the fight to Labour in the country. Pippa? Well, I think ultimately it shows yet again the weakness of her position and I find it really quite unlikely that for all, Andrew, and I'm sure many of his colleagues will wait until the mini-budget to see what the growth figures are and what comes next. I think probably people like him would admit that Truss is not going to be taking them into the next election, that her days are numbered as Prime Minister and that the party really just needs to work out who they want to take over from her so they can concentrate on the important things that people in the country really want them to focus on. Uh, I mean, Andrew, you've talked a lot about there not, not needing to be another leadership contest. But a lot of your Conservative colleagues are briefing and talking privately as well as openly about a coronation, a coalescing around a candidate who can actually have some sort of support amongst your MPs. I've been here since 2017, Joe, and I don't think a week's gone by when somebody hasn't approached me about somebody else's leadership ambitions. Have, or... they, have they approached you, by the way, in the last few days? Look, th th what we need to be focused on... Yes? What we need to be focused on right now is supporting Jeremy Hunt, giving yeah. the Prime Minister and him space to develop sure, the record. I get that. Getting has through someone to the approached budget you? on the 31st Has someone approached you? Look, what we need to be doing yeah, all right. right now... Yes, yeah, OK, well, we don't have we any are. names. That's all we have time for. Thank you to all of my guests for joining me uh, today. And you can watch, obviously, the Chancellor's statement this afternoon live on BBC. That's at 3.30. I'll be back tomorrow.